Hello and welcome back to the Raspberry Podcast. Today I am joined by James Crossley, aka Hunter from Gladiators. For those who are fortunate enough to be too young to remember Gladiators, it was an absolutely enormous primetime television show in the UK where members of the public would take on the Gladiators a bunch of incredible athletes on various crazy challenges. And of all of the incredible athletes um, that the gladiators were comprised of, James was the ultimate gladiator. He was the best of the best. Um, He is also an accomplished strongman and has an interest in historical stone lifting, which is how I really uh, first connected with James. And since meeting him, uh, thought he was very, very interesting and obviously has an incredible uh, backstory and uh, wanted to sit down and have a chat with him. So really glad that we were finally able to make that happen. I really enjoyed recording it, and I hope you guys enjoy listening. Check it out. Probably strong man in Wales, who I know. I feel Never like heard of it. a famous stone in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> when you say a famous stone in, in, in Wales. In, yeah. No, but like famous in the strongman, you know, exactly, the stone yeah. lifting community no is sort of 0.00001% of the And what was funny is I then met all these Welsh strongmen to train with, and... Um, I said the name in Welsh, and they said, well, that means hospital. So they were just laughing their heads up. It's called the hospital stone. <laughs> Is that because it puts you in the hospital? That, that, well, it, just it, a, it, it was the direct translation from Welsh, which was hospital. <laughs> so James just lifted the hospital stone. And they were just like, I, think, I think that uh, so many... Um so many of the stories of the stones that I heard is like they banned them in the village because too many people were being injured or dying right. or being, you know, having their spines broken trying to lift these stones. So, so you know. this was on a farm in the middle of some random dude's farm. And I mean, it was just crazy because this poor guy would had to knock on his door and ask. To, I, was, I expected it to be in common land. Yeah. But it was, um, I think no one had actually tried to lift it for four years or something. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, not the most famous stone in the country. Well, it's going to be a lot more famous now because I am recording. (laughs) We have officially started the stone. (laughs) You know what? I'm actually planning on doing a um, stone lifting tour in Wales. Oh, so I will try. Okay, how heavy is the hospital stone? I think it's about one three five. Okay, it's Mm -hmm. a good size stone. Yeah, I reckon. I reckon I got that in me. Yeah. So uh, I'll be making sure because it, it seems to me that there are. There's a lot less information out there on the Welsh stones than there are compared to you know. I've never heard of it. It was only being at David Horn's house where I where I. There was a picture of him with this stone and I asked him about it and that's yeah. how it all came up. Okay, yeah. I'm going to try and... Because there's a lot of jiu-jitsu in Wales, so I'm Well, planning. he's the man because he put me in touch with the farmer. Who David did. Yeah. Well, David is yeah. always the man for everything <laughs> strength-related, so yeah. I'll talk to David first before I, uh, before I head out there and, and try and lift the hospital stone and hopefully keep, <laughs> keep myself out of the hospital. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> anyway, how you doing, James? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank warm. It's beautiful at the moment, isn't it? It is a it is a pretty hot day today, uh, but I th- you know really appreciate you taking the time out to have a Thanks chat with me. Thanks for coming now. Um, I wanted to kind of get get straight into it and uh, sort of talk about your um, history and training and stuff like that. You know, obviously, um, you know, gladiators is such a massive part, but I'm kind of more interested in what you did before that. I know that you were into bodybuilding, uh, but that I imagine was in your mid teens. So I started at 12. Body, um, bodybuilding. Yeah, bodybuilding. Basically, I was obsessed with superheroes as a kid. I had an older brother, so that was a massive factor of wanting to be as big and strong as my older brother. I was always the youngest at everything I did. We were in scouts. I was or cubs out at the time. I was the youngest cub. I was the youngest in the scout band. I was So I hung around with him and all his friends, and I was always the smallest one. And that started to affect me, that I was always kind of bottom of the pile whenever anything happened. And then... I remember my mum always tells me about this time when I used to go into their bedroom with my pyjamas and pretend to turn into the Hulk. I was obsessed with the Hulk, which was Lou Ferrigno at the time. Yeah. And I'd do this thing with my eyes and I'd like rip my pyjama top off. And I was about nine or ten here. And then when I was 12, this was a real transformational moment, is my mother... I'm sure she regrets it now. took me to see Rocky 1, 2 and 3 all together in a six-hour... Wow. Bonanza. I mean, we took sandwiches, you know, it was a full on six hour Rocky fest. And um, it was like being brainwashed, really. I, I, I was just obsessed with this underdog doing so well. And I guess at the time, I felt like I was the underdog being the smaller brother. So I wanted to be a boxer and they wouldn't let me. But my dad, he was worked in a bank and the bank happened to be next to a gym. And they said, well, you can go with your dad and try it out. And I think they just thought I'd do it for, you know, a couple of weeks. And that, that's how it all started. And then for Christmas, on my 12th, 12th Christmas, I, I got a set of weights, like a barbell and, and two dumbbells. That is, uh, 
a really funny way of getting into it. Firstly, yeah. imagining you as ever being the small person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two, it, it brings up a really interesting point, actually, um, about juveniles or kids, youths lifting weights and this whole yeah. stigma that if you lift weights as a kid, then you're going to be stunted at, you know, 6'3 and 105, 10 kilos. Um, I, I think you're anything but, but stunted. What's your thought on yeah. that whole um, sort of controversial debate? Well, they, they wouldn't let me in a gym now at 12. I mean, but they let me join at 13 then. I was actually going down on my own. I used to cycle to the gym uh, like five, six times a week at 13. So, um, yeah, I do think there's something to be said in lifting too heavy too soon. And I was a bit of an encyclopedia of knowledge because I bought every book and read every magazine I could find on bodybuilding and weight training and just absorbed all this information so I didn't actually lift really really heavy until I was like 18 19 so it was more about the reps and obviously bodybuilding is more about squeezing the muscle mm. and the mind muscle connection rather than moving from a, a to b so because it was more of the bodybuilding vibe I was on I wasn't lifting crazy weights so I think that's okay you've just got to be sensible with a lot of different movement patterns I mean, I, it did, I suppose it did, I did suffer in the sense of I didn't do any sports at school. They always wanted me in the rugby team and this, and because I was so focused, I was competing in shows at 15. That, that's wow. all I did. So I did miss out on that kind of being sporty in school because the bodybuilding mentality, especially then, and it was in the days when people used to bulk up, was if you're going to run for a bus, miss the bus <laughs> because you're trying to get those calories to get bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was quite skinny. So I was eating all these, you know, tuna sandwiches at school to get bigger. So I didn't do any of the sports on the side, but I think if you do it properly, uh, I mean, I do, you know, write programs for teenagers and um, there was a book I read as a teenager, which I even think now was one of the best books. I don't even know it still exists. It was called scientific bodybuilding from beginner to winner by Bernard Beverly and Earth Arthur Fairhurst. I think that's right. And there was no fancy pictures in it. It was all drawings. But that, for me, was a, a really useful book on those teenage years. And it was all the different techniques of drop sets, supersets, that kind of thing. But also about how to plan your programs and how to train sensibly, really. So, yeah, you've just got to be careful not trying to go too heavy too soon, especially when your bones aren't fully grown. And, um, you know, you could cause problems by bad form and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, a great point, I, you know, the whole too much weight, but too much is too much regardless of sort yeah. of how old you are and, you know, whether you're old, you know, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever it is, you know, too much by definition is too much. But, um, I, I, you know, I've, I don't think I've met anyone who got into bodybuilding was competing at such a young age. I'm not sure if I know many people who are, you know, I've definitely not spoken to anyone or that I'm aware of anyone who was competing in bodybuilding at that age. Yeah, I, also... I, you know, I think I was bullied by one of the neighbours. I'm just remembering now. And um, so there was always that wanting to be protect myself and um, wanting to be able to be nobody to mess with me. It'd be like the Hulk, really. Mm. So all this stuff as a absorbed as a child with the, the superheroes and then the older brother and then Rocky kind of all came together to make this obsession that that initially we thought would last, or my parents thought would last for uh, six months or a mm. year maybe, which... You know, kind it's of still just, going now. <laughs> <laughs> just really, you know, became my only focus as a teenager, really, which in some respects isn't good because I was very lucky that I made something from it. But mm. it's it's a it's a very very low chance for that to happen, and it did really take over my life. Whereas, you know, at school I was taking six tuna sandwiches with me. I had three paper rounds at school to pay for like desiccated liver do you remember that yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and that kind of stuff and it, it did really become uh, an obsession from a very young age and setting goals very young I remember at 13 writing this down that I wanted to have a have the same body weight and the si same arm size as my age so I had a 13 inch yeah. arm at 13 stone 16 inch arm 16 stone and I got to 19 inch arm at 19 stone and the, the long-term goal I wrote to be junior Mr. Universe at 19 which I qualified for but I didn't manage to compete in because that's when I managed to get um, spotted yeah. the gladiators, so I never actually got to do it. So you had a 16-inch arms at 16 years old? And 16 stones, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I was actually, I was a doorman at 16. This was even crazier. So I was an apprentice as a printer. I was not earning very much money. So I was working two days a week on a door. Um, and my, my parents didn't know this. So I went out <laughs> twice, twice a week in a white shirt and black trousers on my moped. <laughs> 
And um, I was working this door, which basically earned me triple what I was earning um, as an apprentice. And that's what, again, what I used to buy extra eggs and food and stuff like that. And I didn't, my parents didn't find out until I was 18 because one of my dad's co-workers came into the pub <laughs> and he was like, and then they found out like two years I was working this door, which uh, nobody knew. But, you know, at the time it was um, a great way of earning money and um, I didn't really go out or drink. It was all about the bodybuilding. So, and it was quite actually quite a social thing to do at the time. Yeah. This was in York. Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned obsession and you said how, uh, you know, obsession, you're, you're lucky that you were able to turn that obsession into something that you do for the rest of your, you know, you make a career out of it. But at the same time, without that obsession, nobody excels in any industry, in any sport, in any field without that obsession early on. So it's sort of, uh, you, you know, you were able to make a career out of it because of that obsession, not in spite of that or, or lucky because of that, you know, I feel like you kind of make your own luck there because by the sounds of it, you were 100% in from the age of, you know, 13, 14 years old. Yeah, I think to be a champion at anything, you have to be all in. And it, it, it's it's a case of, um, you know, I was never genetically gifted to be strong or big or that kind of thing. I was tall, but I'm not like a massively built, naturally big man. You get these people who, are, you look at them and they look like tanks and they've never even been to the gym. So it was really about that complete and utter dedication and commitment, which you're right. You see these Olympians and you talk to them about them swimmers training five hours a day and all this. And it is about putting that commitment in writing those short and long-term goals like I did you know this is what I'm going to do here this is what I'm going to do and then changing them and moving on and that is really the way to kind of be the best at what you want to be so yeah my, my mother always says to me actually well it wasn't luck it was the fact that you were this kind of in this mindset from such a young age and yeah. then after you know seven years of doing it you managed to kind of monetize it I suppose yeah absolutely I think a huge disservice to yourself saying that it, luck was anything to well do there was it. definitely a percentage of luck yeah yeah <laughs> what is it uh the, the the harder you work the luckier you get well this is the thing because I was actually I was in a bodybuilding magazine that's how they spotted me so I'd just done a bodybuilding show and there was a picture of Johnny Weismuller as Tarzan and then me from this bodybuilding show and they said is James Crossley the next Johnny Weismuller which sadly never was <laughs> but that, that that's what the producers of Gladiators saw and that's how they invited me for an audition so it was just being in that magazine at the right time they probably wouldn't have seen me if I hadn't been in that magazine they wouldn't have seen me from bodybuilding shows mm. but at that time there was no social media so they were flicking through bodybuilding magazines looking at options for the females and the guys because they, yeah. they wanted to kind of add to the team so you were you started Gladiators in the second season that's right yeah, yeah. so was it already a massive show? Because obviously Gladiators, for anyone who is uh, lucky enough to be too young to remember Gladiators, <laughs> yeah. uh, or the original Gladiators, but for, for anyone, you know, sort of 30 to 40 and, and, and above, you know, Gladiators was one of the bigger shows in the country, if not the bigger show in the country. It was absolutely huge. I think it was like 10 or 11, 12 million people were watching this show every week. Um, was, was it that much of a hit from the first season? No, I mean, um, I'd seen the show mm. and I think, because I know that they, I think they started uh, probably six, seven million. I know they picked to 18 million over the wow. space of nine years. So when I joined it, um, so basically we filmed the whole show in two and a half weeks. So it was difficult for me because I'd just come off the Mr. Britain stage, did the audition for Gladiators and I was filming a week later. So my body was this um, bodybuilding body. I hadn't run for a bus. Yeah. So it was then I got there and they said, right, let's get you up the wall. And I couldn't even get up the wall. I was just absolutely useless. And then I managed to bundle my way through the first year, which again was, like I said, filmed in two and a half weeks. And then it was just silence because I couldn't go back to my job because I didn't have a job. It wasn't going to be on telly for six months. So it was, I literally, I went to America with... Um, I think three of the, I think it was Jet Lightning and Trojan. We went to America for a couple of weeks and they came back and then I was just like, and it wasn't until it came on the telly six months later that I started to get jobs come through slowly. Mm. So no, it was a very much a slow, it wasn't like suddenly, wow, you're like really well known. It took about three years for it to seep in. And I think it was about year three or four that we started to hit those 10, 11 million yeah. and then it, it peaked and then obviously it tailored off a little bit. But, you know, I had to massively train, change my training to become a gladiator rather than a, um, a bodybuilder. And that, that year, can I went back there and I had to, like, draw out a plan. And, and it was really a case of every event is so different. I had to find something specific that worked the same muscle groups and the same motor skills as mm. that event. So always wanting to be the best since a child. I thought, like, I'm never going to have this happen again where I can't get up the wall. 
So um, I joined a climbing wall. I then, for atmospheres, I was pushing a car around a car park. For dual, I was tying my feet together and boxing. For powerball, I was playing badminton. I joined a badminton club and played squash. So I came back the second year, and I was like unrecognizable from this wow. body because I was training just to be good at those events. And that was the key to doing well in the show because they were so unique. The events were so unique. They weren't made for bodybuilders. They were made for gymnasts. Well, you know, one of the questions that I was going to ask you was... Um you, you know, what what sports did you play as a kid? And you already answered mm. that, which is there was none. And, no. you know, only when you got into bodybuilding. And that's so that's such a mind blowing concept when you see how good you were. You know, obviously, you know, no one remembers the first year. Yeah. It's how good you were for all of those other years that you were on the show and sort of how athletic and how powerful. And the fact that you had come from some a, a, a sport that focuses purely on aesthetics and, and not on performance whatsoever to become an incredibly high performing and, and you know like you mentioned that the, the whole concept and the execution of gladiators the show is incredible because it's such a varied you know it, you it, it sort of reminds me of the old school um world's strongest man competitions obviously nowadays the world's strongest man you know it's log squat deadlift at the stones maybe a carry a sandbag carry something like that but then back in the day it was arm wrestling bend a steel yeah. bar uh, you know pull a boat out of the water you know with with a rope and like they were they were always crazy different ones and i know that they you know with gladiators they change bring new events in and change other yeah. events out and they were so varied you sort of had to be this incredibly well-rounded athlete mm. i just uh, you know what sort of mentality does it take well you've already said but it's crazy to imagine you kind of going and training a hundred percent of all of these different disciplines just to be the sort of the 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 make yourself ready for the next season yeah so what i did i i i got back from that first year we made a plan and it was really i would say four months before the filming of the second year i was training twice a day so i was doing in the morning i was doing um uh specific event practice whether that be climbing a wall whether that be um, playing a game of squash, whether that be. So being very specific. Then the evening I would do either weights or do some co kind of cardio to get my fitness, maybe hill sprints, that kind of thing. So yeah, I really kind of, um, climbing was a huge factor because if you think of games like Hang Tough, the wall, the pendulum, which was this huge pendulum that swang mm. across the whole arena. They're all relative to climbing. So that that was really um, a huge discipline for me. And when you're like, I was 17 stone at the time, I think, um, it's a lot of weight to carry around. So I really had to strengthen those tendons in my arms. But yeah, I, it, it really was a, um, a massive change. But like anything, uh, it was like planning for the bodybuilding. I did these short-term goals of learning to climb this and this and this, and then a long-term goal. And I just kind of ticked it off as I went along. And you could see my body completely changing. If you see me in year one to year two, it looked, looked like a completely different mm. beast. And it was that mindset of wanting to be the best. And they were like all my older brothers, all the other male gladiators. I was the youngest. I mean, when I was joined at 19, Wolf was 42. Wow. So I always felt there was a bit of a pressure. I know he felt pressure being the oldest which is absolutely fair enough, but I felt pressure being the youngest that I had to kind of prove myself to mm. everybody else. So then that mindset as a child of having the older brother times six, you know, so there was always that in the back of my head is that burning kind of desire in me to, to, to compete with them. So, um, yeah, it really was a, a mental, uh, um, setting the mental side up to then the physical side and then to get there. And obviously when you're there, there's 10,000 people watching you. So it's also learning to kind of keep the nerves calm. And that, that was a real big, thing for me was preparing for each event before you go out there was to actually visualization was a huge part of it and I know it just like looks like loads of fun hitting someone with a pugil stick but when you're actually there and you're live and you're competing in it it's, it's kind of kill or be killed we, we, we you know people would get sacked if they would lose all the time so I would visualize the wall I, I remember I used to draw a map of the wall they kept changing the route all the time because we got so quick so they would they would be there in the morning changing it around and I'd be there with a, a pen and a piece of paper and I'd be drawing it and then I'd get there early and I'd kind of practice it in my head and draw it out. I'd sit there at night what, looking at this map. And it was really about the, you know, my dad said to me when I was nine, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And this was kind of what was always in the back of my head throughout all of this. And you only get one chance of it in front of, well, let's say 12, 13 million people plus 10,000 people live. So you want to get it right. It didn't always go right, of course, because anything can happen in this kind of thing. But you can only be as prepared as possible and go there. So that was always my thing was being 
I always felt like I had this real strong mental side to get prepared and get myself into it. Whereas some of the other gladiators, I think, were more physically capable than me. Mm. But they didn't go in with the same mindset, maybe. They were just a bit more kind of, this is a load of fun. Let's just have a bit of a play with it. Whereas I've always been a big believer that the mind is, is the most powerful tool. Yeah. And, you know, that's definitely something um, that you can see when you, you know, when you watch yourself compete. And it is, it is a really weird thing, the, the show, because it's not a sport but it's competition, but it's entertainment, you know, it, it's, it's, when you really think about it though, that's what all sports are. All sports are just entertainment, right? That, that, that's all it is. But we kind of put these in a different category. Yeah. Entertainment's one and sport is another, where actually in reality they are both. And then you have gladiators, which is entertainment, but it's actually a sport. And there's a very competitive side in it. And you, you know, you, you can see how seriously you take that competition. And then of course, uh, th- that was proved to be the best strategy because, you know, you, you were so successful in the competition side mm. of gladiators. Yeah, I think, uh, like I, I wouldn't even speak to the contestants. That was just, this is my way of dealing with it. So I remember Cobra, who was like the Joker. He'd be there chatting away to them and pretending to be Norman Wisdom and doing monkey impressions. But then you go against him on the duel. You look at him and you're like, well, I've just been, had him on a lead being a monkey. You haven't got that same kind of, whereas if I'm just looking at you like this, and I haven't spoken to you. You've just yeah, seen me walking ter- around. Terrified right now. And I'm like this. You're like, hang on a sec. This guy's a psycho. It's yeah. a lot more intimidating yeah. than Norman Wisdom, isn't it? And so I wasn't, you know, I was fun and games with him afterwards. But beforehand, it was all, all business with me. And that was just my way of dealing with it. And everybody had a different strategy. But that, that was just, for me, what seemed to work. And was that something that you were unique within the gladiators to doing? Because I, f- I feel like, you know, what, what you're explaining there is sort of mental warfare it's intimidation yeah. and when you see you compete against people um you know especially with the uh w- you know with the sticks and stuff like that when it's a one-on-one when you see that you can see you intimidating and getting into people's heads was that something that only you did or was that something that I think there was a couple of them but obviously not, wolf yeah. you know was that doing that in a very different way the thing but- is with wolf is that because we had to be careful with wolf he would maybe speak to you and say i'm going to push you off sometimes he would just do it but there was always a danger factor. So he might say to you afterwards, I'm going to push you off the pyramid. Do you see what I mean? Just because he didn't want to hurt anybody. Okay. But sometimes he'd get so absorbed with Wolf, he would just push you off. And that's when there ended up being, you know, occasionally there were the real fights that went on with him because yeah. he just pushed you in the back and you go rolling off a pyramid. You know, you're going to have fire in your eyes. So he would often talk to the contestants to work out a little bit of something to go, you know, at the end of the, sh- uh, of the event or something. Um, but yeah, there was a few of them that were quite, I think Warrior and Rhino were, were quite intimidating. I mean, Warrior was six foot five and 22 stone and Rhino was very competitive. So everybody had a slightly different way around it. Um, but um, yeah, there were some that just enjoyed chatting away and they just, that, that was their way of focusing it. So mm. it's like anything, we all find a different groove to, to sit into the, the job or the, the, the competition that we're we're in yeah it's so interesting because you cut you came from some uh background of competition but non-direct competition yeah. in, in bodybuilding so you know it's just so interesting that you didn't come from you know watching you compete in gladiators you would have thought he's come from boxing or he's come from uh rugby or he's come from a sport like that so was that something because i imagine sort of all of that mental preparation and all of the competitiveness and the gamesmanship that you would have had c- competing in bodybuilding would have done very little to transfer over very to gladiators so, yeah. that you, you had to build that up in the job. Yeah. I think sometimes in life there are, there are moments which are transitional in your life and a bit like the Rocky six. I don't think I'd have been so obsessed with being the underdog trying to be the best at something without watching Rocky. And I remember in that first year of gladiators when I was just, and it's, it's funny that because people don't remember it, because I've had this conversation with uh, uh, gladiators. Hey, you have a, a podcast that I did. And they were like, well, we don't remember that. But for me, obviously, it was a huge thing. Mm. Um, but I remember the producer coming up to me at the first year and he said, Hunter, you're shit. And that was that moment. I'll show you. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I think those moments, they're the things that can really change your life. And that for me, that's, that's all it took. And I was like, right, I will show you. I will come back here and I will be the best. And it was, it was that little moment, him saying that, which seems so small, and some people would probably not even remember it. But for whatever reason, that hit me. I'm almost crying talking about it, but mm. it kind of hit me really hard. Mm. Well, that must it sort of 
everything that you'd gone through sort of as a kid being the younger brother you know getting bullied and all of that stuff where you'd sort of built up this mindset of you know proving people wrong and sort of usurping the 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 ones who are above you and all of that stuff and then sort of was met with the sort of perfect synergistic spark that then exploded into you know the the incredible success you had on the show because you you did you are not trying to blow smoke up your ass because it's a fact you are the best gladiator that has ever competed on the show uh you had a there was a, an event where you actually competed against the other gladiators the ultimate was it the ultimate gladiator yeah it was called battle of the giants but it was to find the ultimate gladiator which yeah. you won yeah and what was that like competing against the it was a, it was a funny one because some of them didn't want to do it but they, they knew the show was coming to an end yeah and they wanted to do something different because obviously like you said they had different games and stuff they were going to bring in so um yeah, because some of them just knew they couldn't do certain events. And the whole idea was to be the who was the best gladiator over the uh, all the events. So obviously we had the war, we had... And you had certain gladiators that would only maybe do the heavy events like the duel or the powerball. Um, but yeah, I mean, what was more, um, I suppose, for, for, for me, was um, m- most impressive about that is I dislocated my shoulder in the first event mm. of that show. So they wanted to pull me out. And I said, look, I'll lose my arm here. I will, I will literally lose my arm. I'm, I'm going to win this. End of interview. So they took me, um, they took me into a broom cupboard because this was back in the day. And they put a painkiller on my shoulder so I couldn't feel it. And then I carried on. But it's funny because if you watch the show, I, I come off the rings at one point and you can see my shoulder. And Ulrika says, are you all right? <laughs> because you can literally see it. See it. But um, yeah, it was, um, it was for me. I had to do it. And it, it's something that's the title which was all I wanted to be called the ultimate gladiator again just from that being so competitive but I was straight to hospital at the end of it because you know my shoulder was really messed up but um yeah it was it was I really enjoyed it um some of the gladiators were felt a little bit exposed by it because obviously how it works when you did the events in the show you would just John Anderson the referee would put your name on a thing uh, and he'd say, like, for example, um, Trojan, Jewel, Hunter, Hang Tough. So you didn't really know what you were going to do. And they would put you on these random events in the early rounds. And then when it came to the finals, they'd put them on the events you knew you were good mm. at. So they'd have me on the wall or me on Polax. Um, but in this, you were kind of sprawled with all these events. So I think we had uh, six or seven events. But, um, yeah, it was an amazing feeling for me because, I mean, that was the last show that we did. I knew it wasn't going to happen again. So if someone had said to me, you will lose your arm, but you'll win this, I'd have said, take the arm off. That, that, that was my mentality at the time. I wouldn't do that now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, that, that's yeah. how I was. And know. Was that sort of the, going back to sort of that moment after the first season when you were told you were shit and yeah. you wanted to prove them wrong, yeah. Was that still in your mind? What was that, eight well, years later? Well, it's a later? bit like, you know, I suppose it's been a through line thing. It wasn't something I was aware of, but it's, I like, if I like to say, if I say to you, what colour is your fridge? Yeah. What colour is your fridge? Um, silver. So you just, it's there, it's bubbling, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it's always there under my skin. I know that that's there. Um, but it wasn't something I was completely focused on during that show. It was more of just really wanting to, I always felt that like I was the best all rounder at, at, at all the different events. And so it was really a case of, having something to say yeah you know a, a little a little icing on the cake to kind of say well, this is the title and 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 um and that's the end of it so yeah it was something i i trained really hard for that i lost a lot of weight um i was almost uh, like a stone lighter because i knew i had to be very athletic mm. to be a competitor rather than be just the gladiator doing one event so i worked really hard for it it was just a shame I'd, at that time i dislocated the shoulder four times anyway so it was a massive mm. weakness um, so, you know, it was, it was, I'd had, to, I've had two operations on it now, but it was always something that was going to be my Achilles heel, if you like. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that you filmed the entire show, the whole season in two and a half weeks. Was that consistent throughout, uh, all of the seasons? So yeah, we were there for a month and then we had, um, what, what's bizarre is people think we were training on the games every week. Mm. We'd get two days training on all the events. So literally, let's say there's 15 events, we'd have two days. Wow. The contestants would have two days. Wow. And then we'd, have, we'd be filming. And we were filming the show, two shows a day. It was two days on, two days off. Two days on, two days off. Two days on, two days off. And in those two days off, you might be filming little other bits and pieces. Sure. But if you got injured in an early show, you were screwed for the whole series. So we weren't there every Saturday night. They, we were literally there. So the first show would be 10 o'clock. The sh- second show would be 7 o'clock. 
and then you know you'd go like that so you had it was very important to be mindful of resting in between the shows because it was very very easy to get injured not just because i know the events weren't very long the warm up practice the stress you know your literally body was full of stress which is such a uh, the, i mean they call it the death hormone don't they because mm. obviously you're wanting to perform you've got lots going on all eyes are on you it's 18 million 15 however million people watching so it was um yeah nobody i remember we'd, we everybody would get smaller because we, we couldn't eat everyone was getting so on edge before the show so um every again everybody had different ways of dealing with it but um for me it was a lot of you see, I was meditating without even realizing it then with the visualization. And I went through this period where um, my mum's quite new agey and she was talk, talk, talking to me about animal meditation, where I would pretend in my mind to be a different animal for each event. And I found this actually really, really useful. And it sounds ridiculous, but um, it, it was just believing that you had almost superhero skills or animal-like skills for certain events. And I found that really useful. And again, it goes back to total belief. And the mind absolutely being, because again, when you only get one chance at it, you've got to be in the zone, as it were, because if you're not, and they are, then anything can happen. So mm. if I was in the zone and I lost, it didn't matter because I knew I couldn't have done any better. But if, if I went out there and didn't feel I was right, then, you know, some people would come off there, the gladiators, if they lost, and they'd be just be like mortified for weeks. But you know it's a, it's a case of you have to be able to put it behind you at stage door if you like and, and move on to to go on to the next event that's such a crazy um schedule mm. that's that's in sets two shows a day yeah for two so days on the trot the the last show would maybe finish at 1am the last eliminator the contestants could be running around at like half 12 wow. one in the morning yeah. uh, that and that is just a a, a money saving exercise to try and get everything done as quickly as possible so they had to book the national indoor arena which is the 10,000 seat arena where yeah. we filmed in so if you imagine how much that costs per day so they had to yeah they had to crowbar it I think they they booked it for three weeks and then they would you know get us in and out as is and yeah you know you're saying that you're you're losing weight because you you don't have appetite but just time wise the amount of time and you know you can't sort of eat in the middle of uh, you know warming up and cooling down after exercises and yeah, you would normally know when you were on an event, so you yeah. could work your way around it. But there were so many injuries. They might say, I mean, loads of times this happened. They'd say, Saracen's injured. Hunter, you're on hang tough. And I'd be there with like a croquette potato halfway in my mouth. And I literally just had to go and do it. Um, so, yeah, there'd be often times because it was such a, a physical show. Um, the, 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 there were a lot of injuries, so we always had to cover each other. Yeah, well, I was just, you know, I was going to bring that up. I know that... You you lasted the entire run from when you started to when the show, uh, or at least the first run. I don't know. Was the second? You know, the one that came out in two thousand and something. Yeah, that was a completely separate Sky Sky Com show. Yeah. Oh, really? Was it? Yeah. It was nothing to do with it. No. no. <clears throat> so you did all of the seasons until the, the 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 they finished. I know so many of the gladiators couldn't handle it, and that they were so injured. You know, after two or three or four seasons, that they had to basically retire or risk you know, sort of permanent injury. Um, it's no surprise that injuries were so high because you're doing these crazy, like really insane, you know, big impacts, big falls, big throws, all of these big things. Um, you must have picked up, I know you've already mentioned your shoulder, but you must have picked up loads of injuries. Yeah, the, the, the falls were the biggest problems. Yeah. I remember one year we had six broken leg, legs from the zip line on the eliminator. And of it was for people, yeah, for contestants because they were dropping off and landing Too on their early, feet yeah. and they were told to land on there but people would think if we land on our feet we, we can get run yeah. yeah so um yeah the injuries i mean jet who was obviously the most popular female uh had a really nasty back injury which he still suffers from now and panther and zodiac broke her neck so yeah there were some and they, and they were all falls so the falls were the biggest problem and with the girls some of them being hypermobile mm. Um, that was a problem because their legs would go places that they shouldn't go and then their spine would suffer. But um, for me, yeah, the shoulder was the main problem. Um, I had other issues. Because I did a lot of the climbing events, I was always taping things, fingers together because I was always ripping ligaments in the fingers. But I worked out if you just taped them together, you could just, you'd have this kind of almost like a ducks. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of worked. Like a penguin. Yeah, a penguin, yeah. <laughs> and... Um, I had a couple of, I mean, there were some really bizarre injuries because, um, 
you know, the safety was, they were tight on safety, but there's always things that would go missed. And I remember jumping off, there was a, uh, an event called Swing Shot where you jump off a platform and land and then bounce up and you had to protect these balls. Yeah. And my, um, my harness was fixed for lightning, I think, who, the gladiator, the girl gladiator had been on before me. And I jumped off this platform 30 feet and I didn't come back up because obviously it wasn't set for my weight. And I, I cracked my heel, but it was, it was an agonizing injury because they had to keep injecting into my heel, which is like, it's like getting an injection into a piece of wood. Yeah. So that, that was actually, um, took a while to heal. It was just literally like jumping off a building and landing on concrete, you yeah. know? So, um, but there was always, you, you know, they did have a good medical team on hand and they were really wanted you to do the show. And I remember in year one, Warrior dislocated his knee and then they just put him on Danger Zone, which is a shooting game in a wheelchair. So they would try and get you out there because obviously if you weren't on television, then you didn't get the appearances and stuff, which actually is what, how we made money, really. Mm. So you needed to be, if you got injured in an early show and they took you off then you, and you were off air, that would be a real problem for you to earn money the rest of the year. So you wanted to try and be on air as much as possible. And, you know, going into that, what was that fame or because it must have been huge sort of in the peak of gladiator you must have been one of the most recognizable people around yeah it was a slow burn but when it when it when it was at its absolute most um yeah i couldn't get on a, tr- a train or anything i would be not mobbed but everywhere i went because i don't like loads of attention and i but i, I you know i loved the comp- competition aside and yeah. all of that but it, it just became a little bit overwhelming and if you went to a restaurant people would be on you all the time and it was all part of it being on a tv show like that but yeah it became it wasn't all the time because where you lived people would kind of leave you alone because they knew where you were but if it's when you went to somewhere because at the time we would do maybe three or four appearances a week so we'd be driving i might be in ipswich then coventry then hull then glasgow you'd be literally going all over the country doing various jobs so that when you went somewhere else and you were a novelty, that's when people would be quite full on. But we'd go to turn on Christmas lights. There'd be 10, 15,000 people turn up. And, you know, we got some amazing jobs. We did. I mean, one of my favorites was Euro Disney. We, um, we opened Space Mountain in Euro Disney. Wow. I remember I was sat next to Cliff Richard for one ride and then Paul Young for the next. And it was just like, so then I had Darth Vader. <laughs> so there was, uh, you know, we, we had some amazing moments and um, some amazing memories. So it was kind of worth it. It's just all part of being on television is that, you, you know, but it's, um, I would never say I wish I, that hadn't happened because it's all part of, uh, it was all part of the arc of being on Gladiators, you know, sure. which was an incredible experience. Yeah. And sort of you get out of, or Gladiators finished and you're what, late 20s? Yeah, I must have been 27, 28. And, you know, obviously now, what? 15 20 you know coming up to 20 years yeah. later you're still in fantastic shape so it's obvious that you know in terms of your training your fitness physique whatever it is you continued carrying on after that show ended what was the transition like out of because from from talking to you even for the you know half an hour that we've been speaking it's so obvious that you are 100% in on whatever you do in from the age of 12 years old in bodybuilding and then able to make an instant switch to be 100% in on gladiators to be the best gladiator there is. When you leave that show, surely that's a a dormant, that's an intrinsic personality trait of being 100% driven in one direction. So what direction did that? Yeah, I mean, obviously it was difficult mentally. It's a bit like being a footballer and then being retired. Retired, And it's like, what do you do now? So... Gla- uh, gladiators got me into doing a lot of pantos you know okay. pantos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think well i've done 20 in total but i think at that time i'd probably done 12 when it when it because i still did them after it finished and i really enjoyed being on stage so I, I retrained as an actor i did two years in london um acting and it gave me a purpose what i needed was a purpose because i was mm. had no purpose to be the best at climbing a wall so all those skills with the pugil stick and that were all dormant yeah <laughs> because they're useless in the real world aren't they so I had to kind of think, right, what am I going to do now? Training-wise, I just ticked over. I did the two years acting, and then I started touring as an actor. So um, I did eight years of theatre. Wow. So and that, the that's, peak, uh, yeah, the peak, I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I did two years with Peter Hall in America doing As You Like It, which was an, an unbelievable experience. So I was working with his daughter, Rebecca Hall, who's now like a movie star. Dan Stevens, who's now a movie star. And, and me, who was playing Widow Twanky <laughs> in all these pantos. So that was, um, 
you know, that was an incredible acting experience. But then all I got was tours, really. That, that was the best one I did. And then I was touring. I did six around the UK. And the lifestyle just didn't suit my personality. It was um, living in people's spare rooms and, you know, just doing one show a day and then being stuck in some random place. Mm. So after seven years, I decided um, just to knock it on the head, basically. That, did you ever have any... Um you know, any desire or any thought about becoming an actor before you got into Gladiators? Or was that something that just you got approached to do Panto, you did that and then thought, you know, I quite like this acting thing, I'm going to go and do that? It was exactly that. I, want, I didn't have the passion to be an actor like I did when I was bodybuilding or a Gladiator. But it was like, what do I do now? This seems like quite an interesting job. And I needed a purpose to put my energy into, which the acting course, you know, I really enjoyed the learning of the craft. Um... I just struggled with the touring life. You know, it's, it's, you're a week in each, well, for example, an English tour, you might be a week in Manchester. You're living in, you know, a little, you've got all day to kick around. Then you're doing one show at night and it's very hard to have roots. Then you're going to Liverpool the next week and then you're in Glasgow the next week. And these tours would be eight to nine months. And I did mm. seven years of it. Wow. Um, so after seven years, that, that I, I literally said, I, I remember actually, I think I was doing a panto in, at Liverpool somewhere and I was dressed as Abanaza who's the baddie in Aladdin you know had this big hat on and these massive eye makeup and I just thought like, this is it now this is the last one <laughs> I can just imagine this image of you looking at yourself in the mirror going oh, oh yeah the picture <laughs> yeah yeah so, and that's it and I've never acted since really and uh, just sort of almost a personal question here <clears throat> for me personally is how do you um deal with your training when you're on the road so much in terms of your physical training because it's something that i do you know i do n not to the extent that you do but you know i go away to travel to teach jujitsu and, and stuff like that and it it's so disruptive you know because one thing when it comes to training is you have your gym you go there this this time this time three times a week or whatever it is you have all of your equipment you have your program and then suddenly you're touring or you're traveling around and you're moving every week or every day and you're just dropping into random gyms and how do you you know or what are some of the tips that you have found from many years of doing that well at the time i had no training purpose so i wasn't training anything for any specific so i didn't have any fire in my belly which i think is really important to make progress so I was in what, what I would call maintenance mode mm. and what I would do because I'd, I was time heavy in a sense I've had, I've had all day I would find a gym I would find one of the cast who was up for it take them and I would just do something just to keep moving but it would just be varied and I would do you know I was still training four or five times a week but it was more a case of filling the day yeah. and um I wasn't doing anything crazy. It was almost like bodybuilding style training, just nothing heavy, just probably sp split it like chest, biceps, and then shoulders back, and then maybe legs on their own. And But it was nothing, I wasn't pushing myself. It was just literally filling the day going from A to B. But in my 30s, um, I definitely had a drop off in that area. You know, I, I was, I almost looked quite, also with the acting, I started to be quite a big, I hadn't drunk in my teens or my 20s ever. So I started to become, it's all part of, you do a show, you drink five pints. <laughs> it became part of mm. it. You know, we'd go up to the Edinburgh Festival. Mm. It's like a real social experience. So the first time in my life also, I was introduced to drinking, which, you know, also, so my physique and everything, I was a, a kind of um, a very different. I always, I look back in my 30s, I look a bit grey and a little bit kind of skinny and, um, and don't look very happy because it was not really my... What, what sits comfortably with me physically but it was just kind of what I'd what I'd fallen into I suppose and at what point did that period of your life in terms of obviously you you, you stopped acting then you got back in the training because you know to, to, to ima imagine you you're in unbelievable condition unbelievable shape for someone you know just full stop I feel like you know I remember training with you well, it was probably a year, year and a half ago now yeah, last yeah, time we yeah. trained um, a commando temple and just thinking that, you, you know, you're in better nick than you were when you were competing on Gladiators. Like, just unreal in your, I believe, late 40s. 48, yeah. You know, just... So you obviously got back into training. What was it that got that far in your belly? So basically, once I finished acting, I needed something to do. And um, so I, that's when I started to get... I already had a personal trainer qualification, but I kind of spent a year doing 
strength and conditioning, um, just all these different qualifications, just really for something to, to give me purpose. Mm. And then I started doing a little bit of personal training. As uh, My main job is I'm a landlord. I rent houses out. So I've always had a back burner of earnings, if you like, where I can then dress stuff around that. So I started doing that. And then I needed something to give me focus. And that's when I started strongman training. So I was probably... Um, in my kind of mid thirties, yeah, late thirties when I started doing that. And I started entering novice strongman competitions and that gave me that fire in my belly that gladiators had given me and it gave me a focus and it was something I actually really enjoyed training for. So that's when I kind of got stepped it up again. So I had that lull in my thirties when I was acting training wise and it was, I had some great life experiences. And then in the late thirties, early forties is when I kind of picked it back up again. Mm. because i um actually saw you the first time um when you were competing in a strongman competition at is it bulldog gym dave beating oh london's strongest man yes yeah. i have a good friend of mine ah. who is a um female strong woman competitor and uh she was competing there that day uh and that was the first time i was like oh it's hunter from gladiator yeah, yeah. and you won that competition yeah there, the master's yeah. division there i think uh just smashed it and then uh yeah i guess it's, you know strongman makes sense i think for when when you look at your journey and you look at all of the stuff you did so many strong men sort of start out in bodybuilding they get this incredibly big frame and then they want to put it to good use and uh you know you've had a lot of success competing in strong man yeah i mean i i would always class myself as a strong bodybuilder because i'm not that physique of a strong man i'm not really and i always struggle to pack the food in that strong men eat because mm. how my body has eaten for so many years I'm, um, I don't feel comfortable overeating. So I couldn't bang the calories down like, you know, strong men often do. They have this huge new diet, don't they? So I still ate like a bodybuilder, but I trained like a strong man. Um, but, um, I, I enjoyed the strong man training, but I didn't live the strong man lifestyle, if you like. And, um, again, it was, I was really committed to doing it and I really was all in, but I did find, lifting the weights that were that heavy started to become a problem. Obviously, I had a massive weakness with the shoulder. And then slowly stuff started to go bit by bit. And that, that's the, the, the trouble was, being a bit older as well, I was more prone to injury and having some existing scar tissue and issues. So I had to be really careful because throughout my strongman journey, which I think was about seven years, that I always had big problems that I had to deal with injury-wise, which I had to then work out and then try and work around and work out and try and work around. But it was always nice to have that competition to train for, which was a bit like the bodybuilding or gladiators days. And mm. I really loved doing the competitions and just turning up there and going for it. But yeah. London's Strongest Master was one of my favourites, actually, because there was such an amazing crowd there. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was good fun. And, y you know, we've spoken about it briefly, but you mentioned it again. I want to kind of get into more depth with it about training around injuries and obviously you know when you're doing something like gladiators in your 20s you're just going to get injured because you're doing crazy stuff yeah. that you're going to get injured with like there's no I, I almost feel that you can't be a gladiator on that show and not pick up injuries especially with the schedule that you guys were recording at but then obviously the injuries become very different as you age where it's not so much that you're being injured because you do something that's 100% guaranteed to injure you but you start to pick up more injuries just sort of that wear and tear from many years of training you know yourself started training when you were 12 years old mm. that's many many miles on the clock there how do you um, deal with injuries both on a physical um, you know in a physical way in terms of working around injuries and still being able to train and also sort of in a psychological way it was difficult because you know, I was constantly getting injured during the strongman and, and and I was very keen to get it right. And you know, obviously that failed to prepare, prepare to fail, which has been a through line to my training in the life. And it was a case of just trying to get that balance of realizing the older body can't take the hammer that the younger body can and to prioritize rest and soft tissue like massage for me is a real big thing to, to help with, you know, preventing injury. Um, also, you know, proper amount of sleep and not training too much and also not training too heavy. The temptation in strongman is to pack on the weight, pack on the weight, but limiting the amount of times you actually really go for it. And, you know, the events, the, the problem is the events 
can be so problematic in the the movement patterns. So just lifting a barbell is one thing, but you put a, a, a car, you roll a car, for example, which is often a strongman event where you have mm. to roll a car. It's not something you can really practice. So suddenly you do that in a competition, your bicep is under a stress that it's really never been under before. And it's, it's, it's difficult to find something that can completely p- prepare you for that. And that's what I would found is often in the, uh, when I was actually doing the competitions, there'd be event that I could only practice so much. And then, you know, you'd find you'd get nicks and, and, and tears from that. But um, yeah, I, I always kind of work around it and a lot of strapping and a lot of physio. And I think it just got to a point where the injuries were overtaking everything else. And that's when I had to really kind of knock it on the head. And is that when you got into yoga? Well, I've been doing yoga since Gladiators because uh, that was one of the things I did in that first year to improve my athleticism. So okay. I realized I was like, you know, stiff and couldn't move. And then yoga is one of the things that really helped me with climbing because being able to lift your legs high. So I've picked it up and put it down for many years, the yoga. And um, my girlfriend's a yoga teacher. So it was a case of um, when lockdown came, work for me pretty much stopped mm-hmm. and I needed something I needed that purpose so I thought well she said well why don't you just do your yoga teacher training just for something to do so I did my teacher training in lockdown for uh two styles for vinyasa and yin and um that, that's how I got into then I, the idea really I was, I was just doing it for myself and I wanted to teach over 40s men that was you know people like me and then the studio where I um was doing a bit of strength and conditioning training in Clapham called Sedana Wellbeing. They said, oh, we need teachers to stream live over lockdown. So I basically, my, my, my training, if you like, was a year on my own with a camera streaming yoga. And that's really, because I was doing it like two or three times a week. Mm. So that, and that was doing my own practice. And then, you know, I had people on Zoom and stuff like that. And that's how I really kind of got into it. But my body, I have to be careful not to overdo the yoga because the lower back, you can overstretch the tendons because we're have doing so many weights, you're a very different body type to a yogi. But what I always try to do is relate to people who've done a lot of sport or who are male. And it's a slightly different practice to what would work for a, you know, a, a woman that can bend herself into a pretzel. Yeah. That it's more about the strength and mobility and flexibility and, and working around your body type. That, 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 that's my philosophy with it. Um, as a, as, a, as a male who's like 48 um, and, and, and not overdoing it. Because like anything, if you overdo something, your body will, will kind of tell you. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I've actually never thought about that, but it's so true. You know, I've, I've never had a great experience with yoga. Mm. I've tried it many times and uh, I consider it a form of torture. Yeah. Um, and then when I think about it, you know, I had a, a guy on the podcast who does a, um, he has a site called Yoga for BJJ. And I did some of those and they're actually probably some of the best ones I've done, mainly because they're short. Yeah. So 10 minutes of torture is a lot more bearable than an hour and a half of torture. But all of the classes that I've ever done, even though I've had some really great um, yoga instructors, they've always been these really supple women yeah. Yeah. who can bend into different positions. And then I'm just there looking ridiculous, unable to do anything. Yeah. It must be so different to because when you look at your build, you could never guess no. that you'd be someone who does yoga. Yeah. The style of yoga that you teach must be so different. And then it makes, you know, it almost just clicked for me that it makes sense that that would be yeah. so different. Yeah. I mean, the joy about yoga is, and, and this is what, you know, teachers will always say is, it's, it's your body you've got to listen to. And my bone compression points and yours are completely different. So my warrior one or warrior two is going to look different to yours. And it's just a case of, finding what's right for your body but that being said if you're new to a class it's very hard to find what works for Mm. you so it's about having a little bit of experience and because I'd had experience at doing yoga I kind of knew what worked for me and I think one of the appeals for me is where I teach a lot of men turn up because they know that I'm not one of these that's mega flexible in all Mm. these different I mean you can imagine my shoulder flexibility is terrible but there's always a way around it using a band for your shoulders, maybe sitting on a block to raise your hips. And that way, the, the people who are tight and of, often men who are tight in hip flexors and hips can still get a massive benefit without feeling flat because they can't do something. Yeah, because I feel like so many of the people who do yoga are actually people who are just very flexible to begin with. <laughs> like yeah. You feel that the people who gravitate towards yoga are people who um, are naturally 
gifted in well you know not gifted in yoga but they're naturally flexible and they can do all of the movements no problem so they go there and it's yeah it's just like an hour of me being like mindfully moving and it's not painful really and it's not too hard and then you have people who are you know absolutely not built for it really really struggling with that so um yeah that's really interesting yeah it's absolutely true so i um because i've had wrist problems um i practice on blocks so i have my hands on blocks for instance which a it gives me a bit more room to move and also it protects the wrist so by no means am i a textbook yogi but yogi yoga is about nourishing your body whatever body type you have and if you can nourish it uh, whatever state it is in, in a sense of injury or whatever um, uh, type of body you have as far as how it's built with the bone length and all that kind of thing. That, that's, that's the goal, isn't it? So mm. you've got to find the right teacher, I think, who will work with, with you and, and, and the right level as well so you don't feel frustrated. Because in a class, obviously, you can't give somebody one-to-one. Yeah. So if you've got someone that's a complete beginner and it's a vinyasa class and someone who's all you can do is give them regressions or a progression if you like but it might be just too quick for them so it's 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 finding that level of class that suits your body really yeah that's it's such a good point i think uh, really really valuable um but that's it you know find a- anything you do you've got to find someone to teach you who you sort of resonate with yeah uh, especially yeah. when it comes to something physical like that um you know, talking about you, you know, getting older and injuries and continuing your training, of course, you know, we have the at least briefly mentioned that you did get back into Gladiators for, was it one episode or one yeah, show? Yeah, I mean, that, that was all a bit of a strange thing because what you're talking about when the sky had the Gladiators when it came back. Yeah, when they had the old versus new. So basically what happened is the the sky re brought Gladiators out and the viewing figures were terrible, yeah. like really bad. So... They thought, I think they panicked. Why do you think that was? I think just because it was only on Sky. So bear in mind when we did it, there was only four channels. Sure, yeah. Sky is not like everybody doesn't have it. So it, now we've got too many options, haven't we? Yep. You know, I, I, too many options. You've got to wonder how, how we do if Netflix. Exactly, bought, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll idea. tell you a story about that, actually, okay. because I watched it. But, uh, so basically, um, it didn't have the, the appeal. So I think they went into panic mode and then they thought, right, let's just get the old gladiators back because <laughs> bizarrely with that show airing, we got a load of work. I mean, as in the old gladiators, yeah. we got, I got a whole year of work from that airing. So they contacted us and they said, we'd like you to come on and do a show. And at this point, they gave us a week's notice. I, this is when I was boozing as an actor. I'd done no, I wasn't training at all. Um, and it was, we turned up there just, I mean, like in no shape absolutely probably the worst shape i've ever been in in my life right and um I, gave I, advi- us- I advise no one to look up what james looks like when he's in his worst shape of his life just just you know yeah but i was in no i mean it was quite yourself. funny because we just found it as a very social so we stayed in this hotel and we were just drinking every night and having it was really nice to meet all the old gladiators yeah. again and it was super fun and then we were training on these events and um they were taking it very seriously the new gladiator just like i would have done absolutely and um Anyway, we were messing about. And because I was in such bad shape, I was messing about on that. I think it was a hand bike or something. And I tore, you can see there, I tore my pec completely. Oh. You can see where it's... Um, yeah, yeah. So I went to their doctor and he just said, you've got a strain in your arm, but I couldn't move my right arm. I couldn't move it at all. And I, so it was only afterwards that I realized I'd tore my Did pec. Did you have surgery on it? No, no, I haven't had surgery yeah. because... So that's why I've got this bizarre looking pec. But anyway, uh, so I said, well, just if you put me something in it to numb the pain... And they were like, I said, that's what they did to me when I just came. He said, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Said, James, is exactly what he, said. he said, James, medicine has moved on. <laughs> you are last on gladiators. So I was trying to frantically find, because I, I just wanted to do it, even though I didn't have the physical capabilities, yeah. I wanted to do it. So I was meant to do Hang Tough and uh, The Wall, because they were my kind of key events. But I couldn't lift my arm at all. Couldn't lift it. And so I said, I'll do the duel. Just put me on the duel. It'll be fine. And it's so funny. If you actually watch the uh, the show, I think it's called... I, I can't remember, but it's the, the new Gladiators Battle of the Giants finals or the Twitter live. And they're saying, right, who's going to do Jewel? And I've literally got my whole yeah. shoulder. Yeah, is, I saw it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I watched it. I watched it yeah. strapped up, right? And I'm sweating, <laughs> right? Because I'm in so much pain. And they get up there and... As luck would have it, because Spartan, and this was the kind of, I was up there on the jewel, and I knew I had nothing, nothing. I couldn't move my arm at all. And I, I'm on the jewel with him like that, and I just said, I'm going to fucking, fucking smudge your teeth. 
dripping with sweat. When like, you when you were up there, up there, I was just like looking him in the eye, and you could see he was he couldn't even look me in the eye. Yeah, he was terrified. He was absolutely <laughs> petrified. And I went three, two, one, and I just went like that, and he, he jumped off. Yeah, you know, he just was petrified, and it, it, just lucky he did that because I think everybody lost except me. Wow. Um, because none of us were in shape, but yeah. it wasn't because I deserved to win. It's yeah. just because I was. Like a psycho up there. You <laughs> <laughs> probably thought, what's well, because I, I, I couldn't hit. I had nothing, yeah. you know. Um, so it wasn't, physically, it was, uh, it was fun to get together, but the whole show was a shambles, really. Really? Yeah, it wasn't. And then they, would, they said, we wanted to do three more shows, and I just said no to it. And the other gladiators, some of them did do it, but I just thought I was lucky to win that. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to, I remember Lightning doing it, and she lost... Um, and she said, I, I wish I'd never done that show mm. because like, the last show she ever did. And she always won everything. You know, she was like the best female as far as uh, being competitive. Mm. But um, yeah, it wasn't a, a great experience. And I wasn't in a great place to do that that show. If you, you think the trouble is, the, the, you know, you, you build this kind of image of being so athletic. And fast forward 20 years with a week's notice they just thought that's what he's going to be like or that's what they're going to be like but all the gladiators they were in terrible shape all of them nobody was competitive and it wasn't you know it was a bit unfair to put us against these new guys who you know so yeah I mean it wasn't a great I mean okay I won but it was it was a loss yeah. <laughs> it still felt like a loss you know even for you yeah I just thought they're just making us look like mugs here because also um, they wouldn't let us wear our gladiator outfits. So all the new gladiators had these silver, beautiful outfits and they made us look like trapeze artists. Mm. They had these sparkly things. Honestly, the outfits they made us wear were horrendous. So it was almost like they were belittling, belittling us a little bit, I thought, to try and build their show as the new breed. It, yeah, it's got a. it's one of those things where you don't know until... It, it can go either way. It sounds, you know, the way that you describe it, it sounds really like a, when a fighter retires for a few exactly years and comes that. out of retirement yeah. and you know they they there's two ways that it can go they can you see it you know even now in the ufc you have these old legendary fighters who are just way past their prime but they still want to fight for whatever reason be it money or fame or they just can't stop a lot of it happens to fighters they just can't stop fighting they love it too much and either you give them a nice easy fight and you make the legend yeah. look good and or you go let's feed him to the up-and-comer let's yeah. make the up-and-comer get that name on his record but at least they have training time yeah, to get ready true. for it. we that's had a true. week yeah literally right guys we need to turn up next saturday so yeah. that that was the problem but yeah you're right it's you've got to know when to hang up the job jock and that, that that was you know I, I just thought it wasn't a great you know but you know we had those legendary years back then and uh and, and they were amazing and the new show i mean it was, wasn't well watched i think they had like a hundred thousand viewers wow yeah maybe they t- peaked at 200,000, but it wasn't... Uh, yeah, completely it didn't, uncomparable, that, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't very... And they, it wasn't that they were doing anything wrong. It just... You Different know, time as well. Yeah. 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 Um, and you, you said you had a story for... It was uh, just something I watched. I thought it was quite interesting in life. that, And it, they, they compared it to Netflix. And it, it's like... You go around Netflix and you're constantly flicking around. Shall I watch this? Shall I watch this? You've got so many options. And... Uh, and before you know it, you've been doing it for 40 minutes. It and it, that, that is the legit thing. And you don't watch anything. Yeah. And th- 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 there was this college guy and he was, he was talking about this on a, um, a post. And then he said, and, it's, it, and it's in life, it's about we don't commit to anything anymore. We're like, should we try this? Should we try that? Should we do that? Well, how about you just commit to something and actually just go for it? Mm-hmm. And he said, if we could all do that in life, now, now people have got too many options you know with these dating apps I mean it's a classic example isn't it I hear these stories of someone being on a date and then she goes to see the guy back at the bar and he's swiping through Tinder too and it's about you know back in the day we used to find something to do and commit to it and that'll mm. be it because we didn't have so many options and that's a mental thing I think is to actually sometimes choose something and say right I'm all in with this rather than oh what else is what is the grass greener here can I be doing this can I be doing this and it's how we related it to Netflix I thought was really nice and yeah. I've caught myself doing that a million times and you think well yeah too many options and do you think that's you know definitely an issue for um, people who grew up in a time where that was not an option and now have so many options and obviously it's all to do with the internet but there are so many kids these days who were born into a world where everything has you know a thousand shows to watch on netflix and you know all the dating apps that you want and you know all of these things they're never it almost the attention span you know they can't watch a video that lasts more than you know vine was like seven seconds or nine seconds or it's an instagram story at 15 seconds and you know everything's got to be quick and fast and and and, and instant instant that's the word Mm. yeah and it's a shame but 
you know, that's just life changes, doesn't it? And it is a case of everything instant, instant, instant. And it's a bit like, you know, I see these evolution posts where the last one now is rather than a guy stood up with a spear, he's hunched over a computer with his terrible posture. Mm. And, and it is a case of, I think, just be mindful about that we are probably regressing in certain ways. And how about, you know, you do have to keep active. You do have to keep on top of what you're drinking and what you're eating and how much time you're spending in front of a blue screen because this is a new generation where we don't really know how it's going to affect us. But we, what we do know is it's detrimental. Mm. And... Um yeah, you know, talking about that, I know that's something that you've advocated a lot for is, you know, having a active lifestyle. I think now more than ever, you know, in the times that we're living in where everyone seems to be very health conscious, but no one's really, you know, such a disappointing thing over the last couple of years, you know, over the last year and a half where, um, you know, told to do all of these things like wash hands and, you know, wear oh, masks yeah. and not touch each other, but not being told to get outside and exercise and to move about and to eat properly. Um, it seems like all the priorities are in the wrong places. I know a lot of people that have massively struggled with lockdown and it's a case of <sighs> sometimes the less you do, the less you want to do. You yeah. want to get something done, ask a busy person. I love that phrase and it's so true. And the less you do, the less you actually want to do. And I think that was the case is that some people, a majority of people really struggle with their eating, with alcohol, with boredom, with no focus and it is a difficult thing to get out of and not everybody has that mentality of right setting goals and wanting to be focused which is absolutely fine you know everybody's so different but it is a very difficult place to be and I think it's a case of now we're starting to pull out of it mm. and um checking in with yourself and saying actually okay I'm not happy with this I need to change this I'm more focused now because we've got more options and I'm not in this kind of cocoon state of being locked away so let's make this you know the start the new beginning and, and start doing something about it because you can't do anything about the past yeah. we're living in the moment which is difficult you know that's what I'm trying to get people to do is to be present in the moment and actually live in the moment um, and then that will affect our future that's the thing yeah and is you know you mentioned it earlier and you kind of alluding to it a little bit there but do you do much meditation stuff or well i i mean i i've tried meditation for years and i struggled with it and then i went on holiday to bali about three years ago and i did a gong bath okay which is a meditation to sound i've done a one gong ba bath yeah thing. i know and it was, you, you've got a massive well i'm now right a gong there. practitioner so it was transformational for me. It was just the most really? amazing, which is a, a meditation to sound. Yeah. And it was the, the feeling of euphoria, the way it helped my sleep, the way it helped my stress was just amazing. So I wanted to find out more about it. And I now, I run the gong baths at three venues. Wow. And I, I absolutely love it. So that's the meditation I do is, is the gong bath. So um, for those who don't know what it is, it is, my experience of it anyway was lying, I did a, there's this really cool um, yoga and BJJ festival in right. Mallorca. And we did one in, the first one was in 2019, got cancelled last year. And it looks like it's going to go ahead, fingers crossed, in October this year. And there's loads of really high-level jiu-jitsu, some really high-level yoga. Um, and they had someone doing a gong bath there. And I thought I'd sign up, see what this is all about. It is a weird thing, mm. you know, just lying on the floor and then someone sort of playing the gong and you sort of just lose yourself a little mm. bit and you get... It is a very strange um, sort of, you, you know, an altered state of consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. W what is going on there? Well, I think firstly, if someone's done it once, it can be quite hard to relax. It takes a couple of times for people to let go. And some people in life, we have givers and takers and some people aren't very good at taking in. So that's something I always say to people first is and just absorb and let yourself take it in. But basically, we spend so much of our life in the fight and flight um, sympathetic nervous system. Mm. And what it does is it takes you over to the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, and the right-hand side of the brain. And this is where all the good stuff happens for recovery and rest. And if you think of the body, without going into the complexities of sh chakras and stuff like that, there's a lot of sounds and mm. in the body and vibrations and it goes back hundreds of thousands of years that how sound affects the body. So these vibrations, especially with the gong, which is, um, you know, has massive vibrations, very, very powerful. They run through your body. And then imagine your body gets caught up in a one-way system, which often can happen with stress. 
stress can get caught up in you and it can give it a little nudge and just give this vibration a slightly different track. So people feel very rested. They feel rejuvenated. They feel um, it's great for people that are angry, actually. It just puts you in this really restful state. And they have what's called a gong sleep often, which is this really deep sleep afterwards. Mm. It really, really helps. And the, 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 the chakras in the body all relate to different notes. So I have various instruments. I've got um, a crystal harp, which is the note C, D, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, all, all up the body. And then singing bowls, um, didgeridoos, hand pans, gongs, and they all make you feel slightly different. And what's amazing is every gong bath is very different to how it will affect you. And sometimes you might feel like you're levitating. Mm. Other times it might feel you, you see animals. And I have all sorts of... It people crying, people laughing, and then people see their parents who die, you know, all sorts. So it depends what state you come to the gong bath in. And also, this is what's really amazing, is when I'm playing the gong, it's different each time because the gong is almost alive. And you think, if I play this beat, this will happen because this happened last week. It doesn't work like that because it feeds off the energy in the room. So it's quite incredible. I've had some gong baths that, for me, have been mind-blowing because of what's gone on in the room, and it's just been what's going on here? What are, the, what are these sounds? Where are they? And you can never replicate them. Mm. So they're all very one-off experiences. But um, yeah, I really enjoy them. I mean, I don't do enough where I'm laid down and taking them and yeah. that. And I need to do more to really kind of, uh, for my own personal uh, growth, I suppose. But I, I love taking them and people really respond well to them. I mean, they're some of the busiest classes we do with the gong bath. Uh, well, yeah, it's my favorite. Uh, compared to yoga, I like it a lot because yeah. I just have the lie on the floor. So. And that, going back to your original question, is that, that, that this is the form of meditation that sits well with me. Yeah. I'm not very good at sitting there and thinking about breath and trying to focus with all the mind monkey mind chatter going on but with the gong it's it, you've got something to focus on with the the sounds mm. and uh is it something relatively new or at least new to the western world because i hadn't heard of it yeah. until a couple of years ago and then you start to hear a lot more yeah it's 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 just not often used it's not known about to the average Joe, but it's been going on for thousands of years, if you like. Yeah, but in, in the UK, is it relatively? Um, I don't know whether it's, it's new. I mean, if you think modern day gongs, pasty is yeah. kind of the, 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 the king of the modern day gong. But then obviously the gongs are from China and, and all places like that originally. But yeah, it's not that it's so new, but I think they're becoming more popular now. Mm. And, you know, I, 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 again, once again, something that I want to talk to you about personally for me is I know that you and kind of how we sort of really got connected was through stone lifting. And obviously that was something that you got into after your strongman career was sort of, or your comp strongman competition career was sort of, you know, c coming to an end. Um, how did you get into natural stones? So I saw a post on Facebook with somebody doing a stone tour with Martin Jancic. Yeah. And um, I just thought, oh, that looks really fun. And um, so I contacted this guy and said, oh, how did you do that stone tour? And he, he put me in touch. And then I kind of came across the Dinny Stones. So I thought, oh, that'll be fun to do the Dinny Stones and a natural stone tour of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, it's going to give me a focus, something to train for. And um, then I found a gym, Commando Temple, that had the replicas. And I thought, oh, that's great. I'll go there once a week and I can practice the stones. So then I got there. So the idea initially was just to lift the dinny stones and uh, do a few, the Inver stone and some natural stone lifting. And um, I think the first time I did the dinny weight at Commando Temple, I lifted it for like two seconds. And he said, oh, that's amazing. And I was like, really? <laughs> and he said, yeah, not many people can lift it just first time. So we started training for it. and You um, did it first time you tried it? Yeah. Wow. But obviously I'd been competing in yeah. Strongman. And um, the idea was, I found that Mark Felix had got the record of 30-something uh, seconds and then somebody else broke that. And as I was training, I, I started to, basically I, I had this target of adding like a second and a half each week. And, and I was adding it. And so I got to about 12 seconds and I, I still felt like there was more in the tank. And I said, I, I think I could go for the world record. And he, Rob, he just said to me, well, if you give 100% to this and it becomes your complete focus, you might be able to do it. And I was like, right, I'm going to show you. <laughs> Did I say that sounds familiar? <laughs> yeah, might be able to do it. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, that that then became the right. This is I became obsessed with it, and it, like fully, as in rewind to twelve year old obsessed. I mean, I was banging my finger with a hammer to harden it. I started because you, doing, did, you did hook grip. Yeah, yeah, hook grip on one stone, the back stone, and then normal grip on the other stone. Why was that? Because the other stone was light in comparison. And the hook grip was painful, so I didn't want that pain on both fingers. So you, you were using the hook grip on the lighter stone? The heavier stone. The heavier stone? Yeah. Okay, you, but you had the heavier stone behind you? Because I think when, when yes. I lift... Yeah, okay, yeah. that's not normal. Yeah. Or is it? I'm sure normally the heavy stone is in front. I can't, hang on, there's a picture there. Let's just okay, yeah, let's have a look. look. Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah, bring it over. Can you bring it over? Yeah, this was given to me by um, Jim, isn't it? Yeah. Here we go, wait, it's people watching, uh, it's a pretty cool picture. Actually, you'll have to tell me which stone is. Uh, uh, I think the heavy ones at the front, is Heavy ones at the front. Right, so I had a hook, brick, hook grip on the front. Yeah. And then, so yeah, basically I was hammering my thumb to harden the, because I felt that, what's the weak link? My thumb was becoming a weak link with pain. Wow. And actually, this is when I started yoga again, the second, third, fifth, or whatever time round, because I wanted to learn the breathing techniques to control the pain. So I was doing the yoga for pain management. I was doing the hammer for the brick. And I would wake up thinking about stones. I'd go to bed thinking about stones. I, w- I didn't go out at all for four months. I was wow. eating lasagna every night because in my head, if I ate lasagna, I'd be whatever, you know, because I was trying to eat like a strong man rather than a bodybuilder. So I was trying to get, and it just became my every thought. And I mean, it was such a bizarre experience because I remember going up there. I did, the night before, I didn't sleep a wink. I was just laid there and visualizing it, just yeah. going through it in my head. And I went to see this um, psychic, like before. Okay, <laughs> this before I tried. Right? Is that is that a um, is that a regular pattern for you going to see it's a not psychic? Not regular, but I've been a few times. Okay. But she's be- actually be- before like a big event or just if I've just fancied something, okay, you yeah. know, a bit of uh, an extra little bit of. And yep. I went to see this psychic, who's amazing, by the way. She's a tarot card reader, and. Um, because you'll see where this is going in a minute. Okay. And she said, oh my goodness, you've got this amazing card of you holding whatever above your head. You're going to achieve something unbelievable. And this was about six weeks before. And she said, yeah, you're going to do something that's just um, just this incredible um, challenge that you're going to achieve. She had, obviously, she knew nothing about me, nothing about me. Um, and I was like, okay, fine. So then cut to the Dinny Stones and... Um, and we're moving forward. Obviously, I didn't sleep. So the first two attempts, I got 30 seconds. And, I, and then my hands were absolutely pouring with blood. What was the record? Um, I think it was 33. Okay. And yeah. So my hands were pouring with blood. I got 31 on the second attempt. That's it. Like, and um, It blows my mind. Like 30 seconds on the Disney Stones. It's crazy. Yeah. And I just... And my, my, my thumb, and I remember um, IF Strongwear, who supplies all the gear, he, he said to me, um, oh, mate, you're screwed now. He said, I said, just take my thumb up. Just take my thumb up. So he used to just put this black gaffer tape around my thumb because it was so bleeding so much. And um, I, then I just had this vision of this uh, psychic saying to me, you're going to, I said, well, I'm, this is it. So I put Rocky on. You can see there I've got the earphones in. Yeah. So I didn't have it for the first two attempts. So I had Rocky Four soundtrack in my ears, right? <laughs> Just focused, and I got 34.5 or whatever on that attempt. Now, the psychic may be a complete clown, and or, or you know, but I believed that she, that it was going to happen. Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, a lot of people, they hear, and, and, and this can be anything sort of, supernatural in any way where a lot of people are skeptical that could be god that could be yeah, psychic powers yeah. that could be the anim- universe a lot you know people, the yeah. universe that could be animal um you know imagery in your head and they go oh well it's a psychic that's bollocks and you go it doesn't matter yeah, exactly yeah it doesn't matter it does not matter and you know I, you know one of the things that i heard uh, that was really interesting to me um i personally don't believe in a singular god but I'm an open-minded person. Uh, but I think I was listening to an interview with Kanye West. And he said, who's big, you know, big into God and, re- and, and Christianity, religion. And he says, uh, nothing scares me because I'm so terrified of God. And you go, whether God is real or not is completely irrelevant. He is his genuine real life attitude and mentality 
that is real regardless of what caused that to happen it doesn't matter if the psychic was real or not or has yeah. powers or not if you believe it then yeah. it can still help you achieve I something thought, how, how, she can't be wrong she, she, she showed me this card well, why have I not got because I've never done the record I've never gone over 34 in training but I got 32 30, around there and I thought you know, on the day I'm, uh, it, it should happen so I just couldn't understand mm. but I, I did think but yeah, so yeah, it was, it was that, again, it was an amazing experience. But then I went to try and lift the Inverstone and I tore my bicep straight away. Did you? Yeah, because obviously it had been so elongated yeah. from that. And then we would uh, plan to do this stone lifting tour. I went to lift the Inver and it was just like a knife going straight oh, in my bicep. Wow. So then I was out for, well, I was supposed to do a strongman comp about six weeks after. But again, I went up there all the way up to Newcastle or wherever, Dundee, I think it was, and lifted a log, bang, tore even more, came straight home. So how many times did you tore your bicep? Well, I, they they tore probably four, but they weren't like ripping up the arm tears. They were like small, small but, tears. But enough where I was, you know, yeah, out completely. So that that happened three or four times in the strongman Atlas Stone. I, I did one at lifting an Atlas Stone. I tore it as well. That does and, scare yeah. me. It's a uh, a lot of people tear their biceps on yeah. Atlas Stones, but and luckily it, does... it wasn't rolling up the arm tear. But again. The, the, the I mean I injured my wrist doing the dinnies and then the bicep and then the knee a little bit and then the shoulder the right shoulder and that's when I kind of knocked it all on the head and thought right moving the training focus completely to nourishing the body rather than annihilating it yeah so quickly just to mention because we were talking about before we started recording what that 30 second dinny hold it's sort of another you see a lot of patterns in as you talk about your your journey and all of the stuff that you've done you see these recurring patterns of sort of sacrificing part of your body to achieve something yeah. you know like you sacrificed your your arm and you would have taken your arm off yeah. to win that 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 uh, match on gladiators or you know to be the ultimate gladiator and then uh you know what what's happened to your wrists in trying that you know in, in achieving that world record yeah so basically um well, I thought I had what's called ganglions on my wrist because they just came from nowhere. I remember my girlfriend saying to me, what, what are those on your wrists? And then I went for an MRI and they basically said that the, the wrist bones have both moved four millimetres. So they've shifted and it's from the weight of the stones. That didn't, I actually think it was uh, the, the following year I trained for the nickel stones, which are heavier. Yeah. And I, well, I still have the record on that. And I think it was the heavier stones that did it. Okay. So you might be all right until you go over the dinny way. <laughs> but I was yeah. happy lifting the yeah. dinny stone for, two, for one second or whatever. became my second target after that. And I wasn't obsessed with them. I just, I just really wanted to try something different. And uh, by this point, Mark, Mark Haydock had got the record for the dinnies. Yeah. And, and I thought, I'm not going to chase that because I don't think, I think it's too far ahead really. Of what I think I'm it was like. at 47 seconds or something. Well, he, 45. he got up to 40, but I think at the time it was 43. Yeah. And I was, let's say 34. And, and now he's built up on it. But, um, so I went to do the nickels and that, that I think it's that's what when the, the wrists actually shifted. But it was still from that that uh the lifting with the the rings and, mm. and the holds really. It was obviously too much for the wrists. So that, that became quite a problem. A very weak wrist, so I have to strap them a lot. And when I'm doing yoga, I, I'm, I'm on bricks, which raises the wrists and takes the stress off them. And I always have to strap the left wrist. The left wrist, which is bizarre because I just realised the left wrist is the lighter stone, isn't it? That that's the mo biggest problem is the left wrist. Really? Mm. And uh you, you know, you, you, you said it there, which is you're focusing now on nourishing the body instead of sort of beating it up by doing ridiculous, yeah. uh, incredibly heavy weights. For those, you know, we, we kind of spoke about the dinny stones because we're both so familiar with them. But for those who don't know, those two stones combined weigh 333 kilograms. So imagine holding 333 kilograms from very, very awkward to hold metal rings um, for, you know, over 30 seconds is... It is something that I trained for and I did a few years ago and I was able to lift it for a good one or two seconds. But 30, 34 seconds is just a, you know insane amount of time to be holding that weight. You know, and, and it was, uh, I think you said Mark Felix hold the record beforehand and he is yeah. one, like, one of the greatest deadlifters. And I actually believe that Mark's record wasn't on the actual Dinny Stones, but was on the replicas did you ever see that they made replicas for well i think he has done the dinnies yeah he has, and he has he done the replicas in because he's currently got the record which is actually less than that in um the arnold classic yeah for the dinny stones yeah because they did did you, you the the way that they made the replica of the dinny stones was just unbelievable 
Yeah, I heard it was, uh, they, they literally are replicas, aren't they? They are perfect rep- replicas, and they did it for the Husserfell as, as well. Yeah. They have a perfect replica that, yeah. where they've gone and they've got the exact same type of stone. They've taken a laser scan yeah. of the stones, taken it to an expert mason who has chiseled away and, and sort of created it as if a sculptor, but it's just, which is, there's something quite hilarious about someone sculpting, so intricately sculpted in and perfectly sculpted in a stone to look like just a natural stone. <laughs> but, but yeah, so for the, for the Husserfell and for both Dinnies, they have these perfect replicas in the, uh, the Arnold's, which is quite amazing. Although I'm, I'm a, I have a feeling Mark Felix won't have hooked at all, will he? Did he just... Uh, I don't hands, know. I mean, he's, I, he's a, he is an absolute Mark a few freak, times, yeah. And um, I mean, he makes me look like a child. You know, he's just such a, his hands are just like the size of my legs. One of the greatest deadlifters yeah. of all time. So I have a feeling he might have just picked him up like shopping bags. Probably, probably. <laughs> um, so yeah, nourishing your, uh, nourishing your body instead of breaking your body down. What does that mean to you? So it's a case of just being aware of the injuries and working around them. Lifting weights where I'm more like the bodybuilding where it's um, mind muscle connection and squeezing rather than putting stress on the joints variety so i'm doing a little bit of boxing a little bit of weights a bit of yoga and just kind of keeping the movement patterns uh, varied and um you know not overdoing it so it's it's i'm not training for anything specific i'm just training to kind of be pain free really and is that your advice for anyone sort of in your age bracket anyone over the age of 40 you know coming into 50s and plus or is that just specific? Yeah, I think of it's the- a case of one size doesn't f- fit all, but you've got to listen to your body. And I, I had a lot of warning signs, signals that I just ignored. You know, constant bicep t- tears, uh, wrist problems, a torn knee. And I was just going, right, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And I kept trying to patch it up, but the, the injuries never fully healed. So it's a case of listen to your body. If you're in your late 40s and you feel bionic and you've got no problems, of course, if you want to keep with the heavy weights. But I think just be aware that the warning signs come up is to listen to them rather than just think, right, I can move past that and I'll be fine. And um, don't be afraid of lightening the load because the trouble is you get used to lifting an X amount of weight and then your body, you know, a phrase I hate is age is just a number because it's not true because yeah. your body changes, your body chemistry changes, your, 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 if you've had a lot of injuries, your body massively changes. So you've got to be be mindful of your body and how you can train it to what's happened in your life and to your age bracket so it's just a case of kind of listening to your body and it's like when we do yoga is saying every pose doesn't look the same your pose isn't going to look like susan who can put a head around a legs uh, a next pose but it doesn't mean it's not working your body in the same way and it's 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 a case of just kind of listening to your own body and the inner voice and saying okay this is what i can do and this is what i can't do but when the warnings come listen to them don't ignore them Mm, yeah nice fantastic advice and i think that that's actually uh that's true of any age have you had many injuries you know what i did i i had uh i had a lot of injuries in my early and mid-20s and i am healthier now going into my 30s than i was in my 20s fighting or from lifting uh both Oh, right. ma- ma- mainly ma- mainly from um mainly from fighting but it's one of those things it's not dissimilar to gladiators in that you you'll get injured like you you cannot it's unavoidable you yeah, will get injured right. because there's and 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 it's the same thing with gladiators in in the way that you're moving in the way that you're falling you cannot control yeah that how your force, body yeah. moves at all times so for me you know there were times where i kind of trained too hard and didn't listen to my body enough or you know i remember in my 20s thinking uh i i had like no feedback no mental connection with my body in any way you know nothing i ate would make me feel different nothing i drunk would make me feel different no supplements would make me feel different no training would make me feel different i was just like there was no connection there you know i was i was like you know the analogy that i would say is i was sending like a carrier pigeon with a 
with a you know some some parchment paper with some notes on between my brain and my body and then as I got older and realized that actually you need a better connection you know now I've got high speed internet access between the two and now I can communicate with my body and I understand if I eat something and my body doesn't like that I don't eat that and then this my body really likes to eat so I eat that more and this training is going to keep me healthier so uh, I actually feel a lot healthier now than I did five six seven years ago um, and making sure that my lifting, even if I go heavy, is always to bulletproof myself for fighting uh, and to make myself stronger and never to injure you. You know, when you're when you're lifting, if you're doing strongman or if you're doing powerlifting, you will. And uh, you, there's a good chance that you'll injure yourself whilst lifting, and that's okay because you're injuring yourself doing your sport. But if you do lifting to try and help your, you know, if you were to injure yourself playing badminton and you weren't able to do gladiators, that would go against the whole reason if you're doing badminton in the yeah, first yeah, place. Yeah. So if you're doing supplementary training, you've got to make sure that you're not injuring yourself for the actual sport that you want to be doing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, injuries is definitely an interesting one, but I think it's great advice for uh, paying attention to how your body feels and trying to really have that communication between what you're doing and how your body's feeling and, and you know, Absolutely, how you're thinking. yeah. yeah. I always say now, nourish, uh, I'm not, not trying to kind of not annihilate, nourish the body rather than annihilate the body. Yeah. Whereas when I was in Strongman, it was just a case of, right. I, I, I mean, I'd be come down the stairs every morning. I, I could barely get down them because mm. I, was, I was deadlifting such heavy weights on a hex bar to get you know used to that three whatever it is yeah and and I literally i would i was it was a it was a tough four months but you know again an amazing experience but yeah it was me at my fullest uh, like all in yeah all in <laughs> and the question i guess the final question for you is are you gonna go all in on anything else can you see or is it one well, of those things where you, obviously you just all don't the know all-ins i've done uh, this is where i'm trying to change my mindset and become more holistic really and that's yeah. why mixing the yoga and the gong baths and you know, I'm trying to change the mentality. It's difficult because you can't choose the passion. You know, you can't fall in love with a girl just because she's right on paper. And it's a bit like the passion for weights and that. Mm. I can't say, right, I want to be an amazing horse. I want to be an amazing horse rider and find that passion because it's just not there. So it's a case of, um, you know, I, I love doing the, the music. It's something I've done for years on and off for different instruments. So that is a passion. Um, I wouldn't say it's a passion like, you know, the bodybuilding was, but it's definitely something that's a bit more healthy. Uh, the yoga I love. And as far as competing, th that was the hardest thing is getting them outside the mindset of I've got to be the best at something. Mm. And rather than that, just, just being a, I've got to be pain free and healthy and yeah. feel good is actually now a, a bigger plus than getting a record, but then not being able to move, <laughs> you know, so it's a case of changing the mindset, which can be quite difficult. Yeah, no, 100 percent. But, you know, then at the same time, I imagine you don't regret any of the stuff no, you've done no, even but with I know the I haven't got the physical up. capabilities of doing for example a dinny lift yeah. you know for any kind of time again so you have to accept that and then just say right it's time to move on put it on the mantelpiece yeah. and let it exactly. go yeah there you go yeah get, get the picture <laughs> literally you know <laughs> anyway James it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and uh, and uh, yeah thank you very much for agreeing to do the thank podcast you. and having a chat with me I've wanted to do it for ages <laughs> <laughs> cheers man <laughs> That is all. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to find out more about James, then you can follow him on Instagram. His handle is at Mr. James Crossley, or you can check out his um, website. His coaching website is jamescrosleycoaching.com, and he has another website, which is fit at 40 plus.co.uk it's got more information about his yoga and gong baths and stuff like that as always if you want to um, follow myself then you can find me and on twitter or instagram but mainly instagram my handle for both is at raspberry underscore ape i also have a instagram account solely for this podcast which is at raspberry ape podcast um, if you want to check out my YouTube channel, if you're not already on there watching this as we speak, it is youtube.com forward slash raspberry ape. My website is raspberryape.com. And if you want to email me, um, then you can email me at podcast at raspberryape.com. And if you want to subscribe, um, then this podcast is on many different platforms, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, um, 
iTunes. And of course, if you feel inclined to leave me a review, please head over to iTunes and do that. Thank you very much for listening and I will catch you next time. Take it easy.